Assistant Dean for Merit, and I want to welcome you to the PSI supported conference on academic mentorship, fostering equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. And I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. It is uh, a great, oh, I struggle to get my. Um, it is important that before we begin, we really acknowledge the land on which we're gathering, the territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee, and the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Maybe if we can just take a moment to reflect on what this means to you as we prepare ourselves for the presentation that is about to begin. For me, the, the thought that comes to mind immediately is the way that First Nations value community and the role that community plays in mentoring. And so I think that's one of the themes that I'm going to carry forward as we begin this conversation over the next two days. Before we jump into our presentation by Dr. Sharon Strauss, I really want to highlight the work of PSI, which has provided an in-kind, uh, unrestricted educational grant. Um, PSI, as many of you will be aware, is a nonprofit physician-centered organization in Ontario that supports excellence and innovation in uh, relevant research and education. They have a number of funding streams, including operating grants, salary support, and community education that is quite successful in supporting the work of educators and researchers across the province of Ontario. Here you can see the significant uh, disbursement of funding in excess of $5 million, most recently in 2018, across medical education research, health systems, supporting new investigators and residents, emphasis on mental health, and a number of trainee awards amongst the many other funding resources that you see initiated here. They're also very active in supporting visiting scholar programs, such as the one that you're attending today and a number of other educational events. Um, if you want to know more about PSI, here are a number of ways that you can reach out and connect with them. So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sharon Strauss, who is a geriatrician and epidemiologist at the University of Toronto, having also trained there and at the University of Oxford. At St. Michael's Hospital, she is the physician in chief and the director of knowledge translation, a professor in the Department of Medicine. She holds the Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Knowledge Translation and Quality Care, and her publication and research record is exhaustive and exemplary and incredible, having published more than 500 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts, which boggles my mind, three textbooks on evidence-based medicine, knowledge translation, and mentorship. Since 2015, she's been consistently rated in the top 1% of highly cited clinical researchers per Web of Science, with an outstanding H index of greater than 100 with more than $57 million in peer-reviewed research grants as a principal investigator. I think her bona fides certainly suggest that she has an understanding of the role that mentorship has played in her career and the role in which she has served as a mentor to launch numerous other careers. So without further ado, I would welcome Sharon to share with us Great. on so the much. topic of uh, mentoring. Dr. Thanks Stress. So Great, thanks. So I'm just gonna share my slides. Thank you. So thanks so much, Jonathan, for the introduction for, and also for inviting me. And, and thanks very, very much as well to, to Deb Cook, who is one of one of my heroes and, and role models. And, and she could give this, this talk any day of the week because we've all learned from, from her um, and our approach to mentorship. So before I started, I do want to acknowledge where, where I work and in particular wanting to reflect that I am based in Toronto, as Jonathan said, and for thousands of years, it's been the land of, of others, including the Mississaugas, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and is now home to, to many diverse Indigenous people. And in particular, as Jonathan mentioned, I think when we reflect on mentorship, you know, we, we certainly have benefited a lot from the knowledge keepers that we have learned from with regards to the, the role and the importance of, of mentorship. 
I also wanted to acknowledge that we are committed to recognize, honor, and take action on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission within my program and on the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry calls to action. Before I start, I do want to mention that I wrote a book on mentorship with uh, somebody who's well known to, to many of the people who are on the Zoom today, uh, Dr. David Sackett. And we wrote this book a few years ago, and I don't benefit personally from the royalties. It goes to a fund for trainees, and I don't have um, control over that. And I just wanted to reflect on that because some of the work that I'm going to be talking about comes from the book chapters. So hopefully by the end of the, the, the session this morning, we'll have talked about these things and in particular wanting to think about what mentorship is and, and what it isn't. And then also thinking about a framework for, for mentorship programs, but also given everything that's gone on in the last um, in the last year or so, really thinking about the importance of the intersection of mentorship and equity. And I and I know that over this, this um, next two days, you're going to be hearing from others, including um, the amazing Dr. Lisa Richardson, who I think is going to really um, advance us forward on, the, on this particular topic. So this is where I first met my mentor. And uh, as Jonathan mentioned, so I did my clinical training in Toronto. So I did internal medicine and geriatric medicine, and I just started my clinepi training. And then kind of as typical U of T, they tell you to go away for a while. And I, at that point, you know, I, I wasn't completely sure what I, what I wanted to do career wise, but I had started my, my graduate training as mentioned. And, you know, I thought, where do I want to go? Who do I want to learn from? And, you know, not surprised to any of you on, on the Zoom call that, um, you know, Dave Sackett had literally written one of the seminal textbooks on clinical epidemiology, along with uh, Brian Haynes and Gordon Guy and, and Peter Tugwell. And he had just left McMaster to start a new center in, in Oxford. And so I'd never met him before, but having read a lot of his work as part of my training, I emailed him and said, you know, I've got, um, I've got a potential fellowship. I was, you know, are you looking for fellows? Are you, um, are you, do you have spots available? And he responded within about five minutes of my email and said, sure, come on over. And, um, and I later learned that was kind of, you know, very, very typical of, of his approach. And this is where I first met him. So this is the Trout Pub in Oxford. And it's, um, it's also known as the, the Morse Pub, if anybody's a Colin Dexter fan. And so he took me out for dinner here with, um, it was he and his wife, Barbara. And he sat me down and he said, what do you want to do in, in your career? What do you want to do in, in your life? And so I told him, and then he said, okay, my job is to help facilitate that. And I will do whatever I can to facilitate your goals and vision. And there was a bit of a pause after that because uh, to be honest, I was so shocked because I had never heard that before. And um, I don't know how many people on the Zoom call have, have had that experience, but it was really quite, I was, I was just really stunned. And my first response was that, you know, how, how could this be and, and in a true, true altruism. And the thing that was so striking is that as I learned over the, the years that I, that I worked with Dave and, and got to know him, was that it wasn't just words, he, he lived that. And, and I think, again, that was, that was something that was, was really quite striking to me. In all the years that, that I worked with him, so I went to Oxford thinking I'll go for a year and if, you know, if, if things go well, you know, we'll see what happens. And I, and I ended up staying for, for almost four years. And it really was, you know, just a fantastic training ex, um, experience. And, and I'm always very, very grateful for that, for that time and, and the learning that I had. But in all, the, in all that time, the only thing that Dave ever asked of me in return was to do the same thing for others. And again, a very striking statement to make, very, very powerful. And so that kind of was what launched me on thinking about what mentorship is. And as, um, as some of you who are on the call who know me know that, I'm, that I readily admit I'm a geek. And uh, so then I started thinking about, well, what is it to be a mentor? And what is it to be a good mentor? And started looking at some of the, some of the literature on this topic. 
And this is one of the, the definitions that really resonated with me because it really talks about how the role of the mentor is to help with the realization of the mentee's dream. It's not to create the dream or the vision for the mentee, but it's to help them realize their dream. And I know it's kind of ironic because I'm gonna talk about equity later on, but this comes from a book called The Seasons of a Man's Life, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So then started looking at kind of what is it to be a mentor and what are the different definitions? So first of all, you know, I think that there's a lot in the literature about role modeling and mentorship and a, and a mentor can absolutely be a role model, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a role model is a mentor. Because a lot of times, you know, when we think about a role model, it's more of that passive observational learning model. So I could be attending on the medicine CTU, for example, and see, you know, one of my other colleagues and say, well, that person is a great uh, attending and I would like to be like them and, and see how they interact with the learners. But it's not that I've had this direct kind of, um, you know, exchange and, and personal relationship with them around this. Similarly, a mentor can be a coach, but a coach may not be a mentor. And in, in particular, we talk a lot about um, coaching being around a specific task. And we do coaching around promotion, for example. So, so in my department of medicine at St. Mike's, when people are going through the promotion process, we assign them a coach. So somebody who's already at or above that, that stage in their career, and they coach them around the promotion process. So it's very much around a specific task. So a mentor can be a coach, but a coach may not be a mentor. Similarly, I think in the business literature and, and more and more as well, we're seeing in the academic literature, people talk about sponsorship and absolutely critical for a mentor to be a sponsor because you want somebody as a mentor who is going to be able to provide you with opportunities, whether those are collaborations or introductions or um, you know, uh, new initiatives to get involved with it really is critical for the mentor to be able to offer those sponsorship opportunities. However, a sponsor isn't necessarily a mentor. And so the, the mentor is really kind of more of that holistic um, approach. And then finally, we, we also talk about allyship. And again, a mentor should be an ally. They should be the person who is, is, is joined with you, as it says here, for a, common per, for a common purpose. And in particular, you know, I always say that the mentor is the person who's going to have your back. And I think there's an incredible feeling of uh, support when you have a mentor who does have your back. And I, and I think that's where allyship really um, comes into play. However, an ally isn't always a mentor. And so again, I think it's important to think about that a good mentor should be all of these things. So why are we even talking about it and, and does it currently happen? And, and when I started looking at this, started doing some reviews on the, on the topic and less than about 20% of faculty members in academic medicine state they have a, a mentor. And there's also some, some perception in the literature that women might have more difficulty than finding a mentor than their men, their men counterparts. And so in 2015 and in, in our university department of medicine, we did a, a survey and, and we at the university DOM, we've been doing surveys every couple of years. And at that time, about 36% of our faculty had a mentor. So then, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I freely admit I'm a geek. And so I started thinking about what is mentorship and what's the, what's the evidence for mentorship. And so did systematic reviews on the quantitative literature and systematic reviews on the qualitative literature. And I'm sorry to have to, to, to tell everybody there are no randomized trials of mentorship. So we um, haven't yet seen a study where we randomize you know, Jonathan to get a mentor and Alex Papiano not to get a mentor. And, and I don't know that we would ever see that. Um, we could see randomized trials of different types of mentorship approaches and, and mentorship strategies. So I think that's a, that's a possibility, but this is kind of the totality of, of the evidence. And you can see here that um, a lot of cross-sectional surveys and updated this then um, in 2018 and, and similarly the same types of study designs. So if we look at all of that literature together and, and look at um, the quantitative as well as some of the qualitative I'll be talking about in a little, in a little while, 
if we pull that, academic clinicians who were mentored were more satisfied in what in what they do. And you know, definitely we want people to be satisfied. I want people to be happy in what they're doing. Um, the, the literature also shows that clinicians who were mentored received more research grants. And I know when I was launching a, a mentorship program in our research institute, this is how I got our, you know, the attention of our, our, of our research leadership team was really thinking about, you know, people who are mentored got more grants, got more publications. And those are things that, as you know, in, on the research side of things, we always like to count. And so we like to count grants and publications. And so I think that you're not going to be surprised and by what I show here that people who were mentored then were also promoted more quickly. So more protected time for, for research, more grants, more publications, promoted more quickly. One of the key things though that I find really, really important is this second bullet point that people who were mentored were more likely to stay at their institutions. I want people to be happy in what they're doing. I want them to, to really be passionate about what they're doing every single day. And, um, you know, and I always tell my, my trainees and my, my department members that I honestly feel I'm the, the, the luckiest person in the world that I, I have the best job. And, um, and I want people to, to feel that. And, and I want people to feel that they have mentorship and, and because when they're mentored, they're more likely to stay at their, their academic institutions. And then the last bullet point on here really reflects, well, what's the impact on the mentors? Because all of the other material that I've talked about really focuses on what's the impact on the mentees. But there's relatively little literature showing what the impact is on mentors. And, and in fact, the literature there is, if there's anybody you know, interested in, in working in this area, this is one of the areas that I think could be explored further. But we do know that, um, that it does have an impact in the sense that it keeps the mentors interested, it keeps us stimulated, it keeps us excited. And I, and again, I think one of the best parts of my job is, you know, is, is interacting with, with the mentees. And when they you know, experience something like you know, they, they do a great case presentation or you know, they, they presented at a research meeting or they've gotten their first grant or their first publication or their first rounds, there is no better feeling as, you know, than, than when your mentee does well. And, and it's just fantastic to, to see that. And, um, and I think that that can never be underestimated how much that that has an impact on the mentors because it does keep us interested in, and keep us stimulated. And, and to see the ment our mentees do well, it's just a tremendous, tremendous feeling. And I know one of, one of the scientists in my program, Dr. Andrea Trico is a superstar. And, and when she received her tier two Canada research chair uh, a few years ago, I told like everybody, I was like so excited. And she, and I, I, I think I was more excited than she was. And she finally just told me like, stop telling people about it. <laughs> um, so if you, if you, if you ever meet her, um, don't tell her I told you, but, um, but it's just fantastic when you see mentees doing well. So then thinking about the literature around kind of what should the relationship be? How should it be structured? How do we find mentors? And, and again, the literature looked at um, you know, the, the typical kind of dyadic structure where a single mentee mentor versus a team. And there's pros and cons to each of these approaches. If, you, if you're able to find you know, a single individual, I think that's fantastic. If you need a team of people, I think it's important to have communication across the team so that people are, are clear that, you know, if you are kind of getting different um, points of view, different advice, that it's clear across the, across the team. You can have mentorship at a distance. So your mentor doesn't have to be in your division, your department, your university, your province, your country. Um, you know, they could, they, they can be at a distance, but you want to make sure that you set up regular times for, uh, for meetings. And certainly over the past year, we have all experienced you know, how much more um, interactions we've been doing via video. And then this third point really talks about the importance of thinking about the needs of the mentee. And you know, if there are particular, um, particular factors that would be important for them to have reflected in their mentoring relationship, I think it's important that we consider that when we're, when we're trying to structure the mentor, mentoring relationships as well. 
this was an, a quote that came out of a, a report recently that I that I thought was really important to, and I found it really important to reflect on in, in my own learning around mentorship. And thinking about how, you know, as, as our mentorship, you know, experience grows, it, it does require us to move out of the familiar and, you know, and, and really look at different ways of communicating, different ways of forging relationships. Um, you know, because as our mentees are, are, you know, really reflecting the diversity of our, of our population. And so really, it's, it's really pushing us to, um, to think differently and, and to really expand how we, um, how we are developing our, our mentoring relationships, while making sure that we maintain that foundation of, of respect and, and integrity. So a lot of times people talk about well, can we assign people to to mentors or you know, what's the optimal approach and the literature shows that um, and again this is largely um, uh, qualitative that that identifies that if people are assigned mentorship it can lead to more of a, a superficial relationship and so some of the suggestions suggest um, that we focus on kind of facilitating mentorship where you know, we, we, we speak to the mentees, find out their interests, and then line up potential mentors for them to meet and, and then um, make introductions. And then encourage the mentees to speak to the mentors, so to interview the mentors, but then also to interview them, the other mentees of those mentors so that they can really get a good understanding of what those individuals are, are like and, and how, they, um, how they interact. And I think that's that's really important, and and I've I've um, been using this in, in my own approach as well. And I always encourage if I'm if I'm you know been asked to take on a new mentee, I, I always in, introduce them to other mentees and and ask them to to meet and to chat and find out like if there's anything that I do that would be really you know incredibly annoying for them that they you know that the mentoring relationship isn't going to work. I think it's important for them to, to do that, that due diligence. Similarly, some of the other strategies that have been identified in the literature and discussed are around networking events. So that in particular, if, you, um, if you're from a small center, for example, and you maybe don't have access to, to mentors is what are the different events that you could, um, that you could identify that would facilitate access to mentorship. And, at one of our national meetings, um, a research meeting, KT Canada, we do it an annual summer institute. Attention, attention. And um, code blue. I apologize, there's Seven a code blue. Um, attention, attention. So one of the things code that we blue. that we do then Seven is facilitate this opportunity stuff. for people to sign up for 15 minute sessions with potential mentors. So what about the characteristics of the mentors and mentees? And in particular, I think it's important for the mentees to be in the driver's seat. And this is from some of the qualitative work that we've done. And in particular showing that it's up to them to, you know, set up the meeting, set up the agenda, um, you know, be respectful of the, of the time and really be committed to that relationship. And then from the mentor's perspective, the, the idea is that, you know, there's, there's three kind of themes that came out of the qualitative literature. First of all, around the, the personal aspect that, you know, as I mentioned in the, in the example when I started off is that this, this, the mentor being altruistic, wanting the best for the mentee, being honest um, and being an active listener and, and being non-judgmental. Non so you, you wanna be able to provide constructive feedback um, and motivate people. And I think that um, you know, this is something that's again, it's something that we all learn as um, as in you know, academics, as educators, is around kind of giving that that feedback. It's also thinking about you know, there's so many um, culture-based dynamics that you know we're seeing more and more of, and, and need to recognize, I think, as mentors and how we can help our mentees um, overcome things like you know the imposter syndrome, and also thinking about how biases might affect our mentees and also us and our relationships with our mentees. And so I think that there's these personal characteristics that we need to, we need to reflect on as we're, um, as we're trying to grow the mentoring relationship. 
Then in terms of the, the relational acts, um, aspects, the mentor needs to be accessible and, and so making sure that you have the time for it and you know, be sincere and committed and, and there has to be that, that compatibility. And then finally, you want somebody who's going to have the experience and the knowledge that's necessary to help the mentee in their, in their growth. So with regards to the actions of an effective mentor, this is again from, uh, from the qualitative literature. And I don't think any of this, any of the things here on the list are, are hugely surprising. Really things around helping the mentee set their vision, being the person who um, you know, checks in with them around career monitoring, when they should be going for promotion, helping them navigate the institution because we all know that there's a tremendous amount of bureaucracy at every institution so have, helping people um, understand and and navigate that i think is critical and we've already talked as well about the importance of sponsorship and then from an institutional perspective sometimes people wonder about um about this last bullet point and and say you know is it really the job of a, of a mentor to to protect the mentee and, and really, you know, in, the, in the qualitative work that we've done, that's definitely one of the themes that came out and that it relates to the, the aspect that I mentioned at the beginning is that, you know, a good mentor should have your back and, and you should feel confident that if you need somebody to advocate on your behalf, that your mentor will do that and that your mentor will be sufficiently senior and comfortable enough that they would be able to take that on. And I think that is one of the most important things that we should be willing and able to offer our mentees. Anybody know who this is? So this is, um, uh, this is John Glenn and, and I mentioned um, at the beginning, so I went to the UK to do my, my research training. And um, the first year that I was there, uh, there's, there was no space um, where we worked, so I had to share Dave's office. And so one day I was in his office and he was there as well and, um, and the phone rang. And um, he answered the phone and then um, he handed it to me and said, um, NASA is calling for you. And, you know, as a geriatrician clinical, clinical epidemiologist, not a phone call I ever expected. And, um, and what, had, what had happened was um, John Glenn, had was one of the Mercury 7 astronauts, as you know, and then when he was an older adult, when he was over the age of 65, he wanted to go up into space again. And um, so, so NASA was uh, worried about sending an older adult into space and wanted to know the risks and benefits of sending an older adult um, into space. And so they reached out to Dave because they wanted somebody to, to, to model it. And, and so then Dave said, I have a geriatrician clinical epidemiologist sitting next to me and that's when he handed me the phone. And this was a great example of being a sponsor. At no time did he ever say, you have to do this, you must do this. He, he was always about opening doors and offering opportunities, but never saying you had to do them. And in this particular case, he said, you know, talk to them, see what you think. If you wanna do it, that's great. If you don't wanna do it, that's, that's fine as well. And, you know, like he could have done that in his, you know, like in a lot, a lot less time than it would ever take me. Um, but it was about offering those, those opportunities. And I think that was, again, a really, really important lesson for me to, to realize how important it was to have a mentor who was going to do that, who was going to be a sponsor. And I should tell you then I did do the project and it led to some other projects, but um, which was interesting. So what are the characteristics of an effective relationship? You know, I've talked a little bit about the compatibility between the mentor and mentee. And in particular, I wanted to highlight that it's so important to have that chemistry. And, and again, that's why I think it's, it's important to interview the, the, the mentee and mentor together, like they should, they should chat. Because you could be a fantastic mentor for somebody and then be not such a great mentor for somebody else just because you lack that chemistry. And, you know, we've all experienced that where, you know, you hit it off with one particular person and then another person, it's just, you know, there's, there's just not that same um, compatibility. And I think it's important to, to reflect on that because you want to make sure that there is that chemistry so that you can have that open communication so that there is that, that level of respect and trust between the mentor and mentee. 
I also think it's important to really clarify the expectations of the mentor and mentee, including around intellectual property if you happen to be in the same academic area. One of the things that I was struck by in the both the qualitative and quantitative research that I've done in mentorship was, you know, it's not uncommon for there to be issues around um, around IP and you know, in, in some cases, you know, examples of really terrible mentorship and and really wanting to make sure then that we uh, explicitly address that from the onset. So I mentioned that at the um, at the beginning that um, you know the, the first year that I was that I lived in the UK, we sh I shared an office with with Dave and um, and so by by year two he was looking around for space, and so next to his office was the the men's bathroom and um, and he noticed that the men's bathroom was quite large, and so he had an idea that he would put a wall down the men's bathroom and and create an office um, an office for me so. So uh, he, he, he did this and, you know, I often highlight that this was kind of where I got interested in knowledge translation, which is kind of the, the main area of research that I do, which is, as you know, is about changing behavior. And so I'd gone home for the, for the December holidays to, to do a bit of CTU attending to make some extra money. And when I came back in, um, in early January, this is what I, uh, I came back to was that the office was finished, but there was no furniture. So Dave just scrounged around and built whatever furniture that, that he could find um, to, to create an office. But one of, the, one of the interesting things is that I, you know, as I said, this is kind of where I got my interest in, in behavior change. And um, as I mentioned, so Dave kind of built the wall down uh, the men's bathroom. And um, so the door to this office then was the old door to the men's bathroom. And I can't tell you um, how long it took and how many people I met, um, you know, where they would swing the door open with one hand and unzip with the other because they thought it was the men's bathroom still. So this is, I always say, this is also where I got my, my start in really how to understand how difficult it is to change behavior. And then the, this last photo is, is um, somebody that, that many of you um, know extremely well, knew extremely well, Dave. And, and so this is to really highlight that it's not just about the career and the academic side of things, it's about the whole individual. And, and Dave was always very clear about you know, not losing sight of your, your other passions. And, um, and, and I think in particular, as, you know, as, um, as he got further along in his career, this was something that, um, that, that he really wanted to, to advocate for. And so he took, he used to, we used to go on field trips. And so this was a field trip where he, um, where he took us on how to learn how to drive a steam train. Um, but again, I think it, it really reflects that you know, being you know, an academic, being, you know, in my case, a physician academic, all of us on the line, this is only, these are only some aspects of us. And, you know, and, and there's many, many other aspects of us that, that we need to make sure that continue to flourish. So I'm just going to briefly summarize in, in our University of Toronto Department of Medicine. I mentioned at the beginning that um, we do surveys every couple of years and, and we've used that to really drive um, what we've been doing from a mentorship perspective and identify where the gaps were, but then also um, you know, where we um, maybe were doing okay and, and really then flagging um, what we needed to do further to develop our mentorship strategies. We also then um, did some qualitative work with our department to really explore that a little bit further and explore some of the survey results. And, um, and in particular, we did this across the different job descriptions and, and different stages of the career and also included people who had left our university department of medicine. And this is where kind of the mentorship piece intersects with, um, with some of the equity work. And in particular, we, one of the things that we'd identified in the survey was that we had quite a big gender gap in our Department of Medicine. And, and in particular, um, as you go through the ranks within the university and then also in leadership in our, in our department. And one of the things that was found to contribute based on the qualitative work was, um, was mentorship or, the, or you know, some, some inequities in mentorship. 
And so really wanting to understand how can we optimize the mentorship experience and how can we, um, how can we facilitate access to mentorship for everybody? And so that was one of the, one of the key pieces then that, that we identified that we wanted to, to work on in particular. Um, there were some other things that, that I mentioned here as well, really um, contributing to, to some of the concerns around the culture, including unprofessionalism and civility. And I'm sure you'd all be shocked on the, on the call to hear that at the University of Toronto that we have um, concerns like this. And, um, and also a lack of transparency. So then to, to try and address this, you know, we really wanted to focus on all of these aspects of which mentorship was a, was a key component. And, um, and so in 2015, created the role with, um, with our chair's um, support, Dr. Jillian Hawker, created this vice chair role. And Lisa Richardson currently um, has taken on that role since I um, uh, uh, left to, to, to do the PIC role at St. Mike's. And she has taken it in a phenomenal direction to really focus on, um, you know, optimizing the, the culture and, and promoting diversity. I really wanted to reflect on the mentorship piece here and highlight, um, you know, that was, that was a component of what we wanted to focus on. And in particular, trying to facilitate access to mentorship so that people would be able to, um, you know, no matter what their stage of career was, that we would work with them to find mentors and to support that mentoring relationship. And I think this has become even more important during the pandemic period and in planning for the pandemic recovery. And Jonathan and I were talking about this a bit, um, a bit at the beginning before we started around, you know, I think a critical piece in this next, um, you know, once, once the pandemic is over, um, is how do we support people going forward? You know, there's been so many, um, so many challenges from, you know, mental health, family, um, clinical, research, educational. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really, really important um, issue that that we need to think about, and how are we going to mentor people over this over this next period? So we've done a, a, a bunch of different things to support mentorship, including um, initially we created mentorship facilitators within each division to help people find mentors, setting up workshops that mentors and mentees would, would participate in. And these were um, all um, case-paced discussions, um, some role play activities as well around some of the common challenges and to make sure that we supported faculty across their career trajectory. So not simply focusing on early career, but um, through the transition points as well. And um, there's a number of different resources and, uh, that are available on our website and then evaluating what we're doing along the way. And if anybody's interested, we've got uh, various different resources on, on the Department of Medicine website that you can, that you can access. So I mentioned at the beginning that, that um, Dave and I wrote a book on, on mentorship. And if you look at the cover here, um, we'd had an explicit conversation about that. We wanted a, a senior woman physician mentoring a junior, um, junior men. Um, and we, we talked to our publisher, got the, got the photo. And um, interestingly, the book got published um, and then about I guess about two years ago now, it got translated into Korean. And usually when, when um, at least in my experience, when our books get translated, we don't usually hear about them um, and until they show up a lot of times. And so I walked into my office one day and um, found a Korean translation of the book on, on my desk. And I don't know if you can see that um, covers a little bit different. <laughs> And, and it really highlighted again that, that intersection of, of mentorship and, um, and, and gender for sure. And, um, but uh, I remember I was, I was talking to David Johnson, who's a pediatric emerge physician in Calgary about this. And he said, he said, well, look on the bright side, at least they didn't change the order of authors. And, uh, but I think this is a really um, kind of important aspect of mentorship that we need to, that we need to think about. And, and we really do need to, use a diversity lens when we're thinking about mentorship. So just wanted to just finish with um, some of the challenges that, um, that we heard about when we were trying to do more work in mentorship and that um, in particular, you know, not everybody sees the value in mentorship and wondering, you know, well, how can a mentor help me? And I think we need to spend a lot of time really reflecting on that. 
I mentioned that we had started off having mentorship facilitators and we had some funding from, from our chair, Jillian Hawker for that. But then over time, the, the funding disappeared. Although the nice thing was that our facilitators still wanted to stay in those roles largely. And then over this period of time while we were developing our mentorship program, um, we did hear a lot from, from faculty. Um, that they were concerned about the, the Me Too movement and that you know, some of them expressed concern around um, mentoring people from, from different genders. And one of the things I wanted to reflect on was, I don't know if people have saw this commentary that came out in JAMA um, almost three years ago now where it talked about how do we become mentors in, in the Me Too era. And the author basically listed, you know, she reflected on kind of her experiences with mentors. And in particular, she said she largely had men um, who were mentors. And she listed all the different things that she, um, that she noticed about what they did um, when they were, were being good mentors. And if you, if you look at this um, and you go through this list, um, it's not, anything other than being a decent human being. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we mean by mentorship. We want somebody who is going to be a decent human being. We're not looking for a superhero. We're looking for decency and integrity. And I think this commentary really underscored that. So just to, just to finish up, um, we, did do a, a follow-up survey then in 2019 and really have to, again, kind of close the loop around the importance of and the connection between mentorship and burnout amongst faculty, satisfaction amongst our, our faculty, that people felt, um, you know, if they were more satisfied with their mentors, they were more likely to be included with informal networks. They were more likely to, um, to be confident in reporting incivility, which is something that we were really trying to encourage people to feel comfortable if they experienced or if they witnessed unprofessionalism or incivility that they felt comfortable coming forward. And so I think this really highlights how mentorship has such a broad impact and, and how it's so important and it intersects with all of these other different factors to really create the optimal culture within medicine because without that we can't provide high quality patient care. So hopefully this is um, this is linked back to what we what I said we were going to talk about and in particular what mentorship is and isn't and it's in and its intersection with um, with equity, diversity, and really needing to make sure that that we address all of these things so we can continue to address the needs of our faculty and ensure that we provide high quality patient care. I just wanted to thank my amazing mentees and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that was fantastic, uh, Sharon. Uh, you know, one of the things that has come up in observations about uh, speakers who are women is the propensity people have not to refer to them by professional designation as often as as men. Um, just as an aside, the the language uh, how we address people is uh, is being discussed to these days. Um, Dr. Strauss, Sharon, as a, as a friend and colleague, uh, thank you so much for your time this morning and sharing your insights, all the research that you have done, the research you have reviewed, your personal experiences and uh, examples. It's, it's been incredible. Uh, we, we do have some time for questions, fortunately, and uh, people are welcome to write them in the chat uh, or speak up if they prefer, but maybe I would um, kick off with, with one, which um, is building on something in the chat. Could you say a few words about discerning um, mentorship from supervisorship? So and, and generic coaching, maybe. There's yeah, so that's, a, I think that's a great question. And, um, and again, I think a mentor can be, um, can be a, sub a supervisor. I always worry about, and, and again, we, we found in our qualitative work that we did that there's a concern that, so if you're, um, if you have a, um, as a graduate student, your, your PhD supervisor, for example, should they be your primary mentor? 
Um, and I think one of the issues that we always have to be concerned about is the, the, the power differential. And if, if that graduate student is dependent on you for resources um, and, um, and whether that's funding or space or whatever, um, you know, I think it's always optimal to have another mentor who's outside of that relationship as well to, to kind of make sure that there's not that potential for um, uh, um, you know, them feeling that they, um, that there's strings attached to things. And it's similarly to, um, you know, like I, when I became um, a physician in chief at St. Mike's, I said, I can't be the primary mentor anymore for people in my department. Um, because, um, you know, again, if I control resources, if I control, you know, whether it's money, space, whatever, <laughs> clinical time, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not appropriate. And it's also not like the perception of others. So what about, um, you know, it's not just for that mentee, um, but what about the perception of others? You know, am I treating that person differently? So, so I think we have to be really cautious around that, around the, that supervisory role. Um, and yes, you know, a supervisor, you know, should strive to be a good mentor for their graduate students and fellows and things. But I think it's, I think it's always wise to have somebody else as well outside that relationship who, um, who can provide mentorship. And then with regards to, um, to the coaching aspect, I think that, um, you know, again, if it's, because a lot of times we coach around a specific thing, like coaching them around a thesis or coaching them, you know, to get through their thesis defense or, um, or, you know, as I mentioned, coaching around promotion, whereas mentorship is, is really a more holistic um, uh, relationship and, and the, you know, the personal academic growth, you know, it's, it's really about the entire individual rather than a specific task that that individual needs to, needs to do. Thank you. Thanks. Great, great reflections and distinctions. Uh, there's a question from uh, Janelle here. Is there some consideration that purposefully not matching by gender, or ethnicity, disability, et cetera, is important? Um, asked because often people who are in the higher up positions have more ability to sponsor those individuals in more marginalized groups. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think it's a really great question. And and it's interesting because we did a one of the qualitative projects that we did. We um, we looked at mentorship across the Department of Medicine at U of T, and then at the Department of Medicine at UCSF. And and this is one of the areas where we did find a difference um, in the interviews, and that um, and in particular, um, I think it reflects that if um, the, you know you really have to look at the the needs of the individual mentee and what is it that they are really um, are really wanting to um, to achieve what are the things that um, you know the, some of the challenges they, that, that they've experienced and so then really being able to um, match the mentors based on that so absolutely if we look at leadership and um, you know there, there are a lot more for example you know white male leaders right now and a lot of things in academics um, and um, and so then does that mean that you know if I was um, if I had a, um, a a BIPOC junior faculty you know would they be mentored by that individual if that is you know if that is what that that junior faculty person um, you know wanted and felt that that was of interest to them in their career path absolutely but I also think that in some of the things some of the um, uh, mentoring relationships that we've set up then is that we might also give them um, or might also um, try and form a, a mentorship team where they'll have um, access to mentors who have maybe had some more similar experience to they, the, um, some of the um, experience, some of the same um, biases and, and oppression that they have. So um, that, the, that you know, the leader might not have experienced. So I think that that's something that we tried to do. And, and so leading towards more of a team approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it may be that uh, potential mentors would, would hesitate because of uh, certain activities or attributes that, that mentors may have, which may make them hesitant to, um, to step into this role. So one of the questions is, is there some effect of having a mentor that may be quite independent from aspects of the mentor? Just here's one concrete example. 
um, the importance of, of networking. And back in the day when people would go to meetings and um, have coffees and chat over posters and um, um, meals and whatnot. Um, it may be that a mentor is, for example, not going to specialty meetings uh, and not able to perform that function. That function may be uh, crucial for an individual uh, at that time in her or his career. And so individuals who perhaps don't go to meetings and aren't big on networking, when it is clear that that sort of activity could be helpful to um, the, the trainee early career faculty. Thoughts yeah. about, about reactions that potential mentors may have to their suitability, ability to uh, fulfill the roles. There are many roles potentially of a mentor, as you pointed out, and it can be daunting, I think, for people keen to explore, take that on and, and help. Yeah, I think that's such an important an important point, and and I think it it, it makes me reflect on a couple of things. One is that um, you know again the importance of having a mentor who is going to be able to be a sponsor and going to be able to offer opportunities at meetings and collaborations and things like that. And if they're if they're not able to do that, well, maybe that means you need you know somebody else in addition. That maybe that person is not going to be you know the you know the only mentor, and that you are going to need a you know more of a team. Um, and I think, because I think that's one of the things that sometimes um, people feel daunted by that, you know, when I give that whole long list of all the things that a mentor should do and be, and it's like, can you really get that from one individual? Um, and, you know, if, if you can get it from one individual, I think that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. And, and that's why you might need to, you know, to have more than one, uh, more than one mentor and in particular around some of those different aspects. So, um, but I also think, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning that it's also important to, um, to have communication across the team because if you have, you know, one of your mentors who you know, says, for example, you know, they don't believe in going to meetings because it takes time away from other activities. And you have another one saying, well, actually you should go to meetings because um, you know, it allows you to develop collaborations. It can be challenging for the mentee, I think, to have the, those, um, those different opinions. And so I think it's good then to have communication across the team so everybody, everybody's aware. And um, one, of my, uh, one of my mentees, um, Catherine Yu, and I have permission to, to share this story. She has a team of mentors and there's five of us. And I always tease her that she goes for best three out of five. Um, when she when she asks a question because uh, um, uh, it's it, it always seems like we're always coming up with different um, d different advice and things but um, I think that one of the key things is that you know when she does approach all of us we all know and we all kind of hear what everybody else is saying and it's also good for us because it's learning for us too. <laughs> sure we always uh, open our minds by sharing ideas with others. That's a great example. Um, a quickie, or maybe not quickie, on um, pay inequities along uh, certain lines. And uh, you spoke about the institutional approach that uh, you have developed, cultivated very beautifully with research from the people in the department and in the institution. But some people are able to advocate for themselves around, say, finances for projects perhaps not uh, for compensation packages personally. They may be able to um, ask questions and seek advice of intellectual nature, but feel uncomfortable um, in, in other dimensions. And I'm just wondering uh, around the pervasive, um, the inequities of pay brought up by, by Sheila here, um, how mentors may play a, a role there, especially in the absence of institutional organizations that um, have the scaffolding of which exists where you are? Well, I think, um, so again, I think it's such an important question. And, um, and I think, I mean, ideally, we all strive for transparency in, in all of these discussions and, and, um, and transparency in financial situations and equity so that, you know, so that we, people shouldn't have to worry about, well, you know, what should I ask for and what shouldn't I ask for? And is somebody getting something that I'm not? And, um, you know, so I think ultimately it's from an organizational perspective, we should be focusing on that and being transparent and, 
and, and, and equitable. Um, when we're in an, a system or an organization where that, that's not the case, I think absolutely agree with you that, you know, the mentor can play that role. And, and in particular, um, uh, again, I'm going to use Catherine Yu as an example. So when I, um, uh, a few years ago, when I first actually was asked to be her mentor, she was getting recruited um, out to Calgary. And, um, and I was in Toronto at the time, but she was getting recruited out to Calgary, but the division head there um, is somebody that I knew. And he reached out to me and he said, I know that you're Catherine's mentor. We're negotiating with her. I would like you to sit in on those conversations. And, um, and I thought it was really interesting. And so I, I asked Catherine and said, do you want me to or not? <laughs> and so I left it up to her. Um, and, and it was actually really interesting. And, and, and I said to, it was Alan Edwards, who is a um, head of endocrine there at the time. And, uh, and I talked about this in the book as well, because I said it was a great example, because I said it, it was, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like the worst negotiator for myself, but I'm much better at negotiating mm -hmm. for others. And, um, and I said, like, I'm happy to be somebody's agent in a meeting. And, and that's really kind of how, you know, I, I was trying to function then. And, um, and I've now done it several times for, for people that, um, you know, offered if, you know, with permission from the mentee, if they want that, that you can, you can either, um, you know, sit in on the discussions or, um, or be involved or offer them, you know, outside of those, of those meetings. But um, it could be, I think it can be really, really helpful. And especially for somebody junior in their career starting out who doesn't feel comfortable, who, you know, no matter what they're, so often people are just so grateful for a job um, or, you know, they're so worried about, well, can I ask for that? Are people gonna perceive me as, you know, in, you know, in a negative way if I, if I ask for more? Um, and it's much, much easier for somebody who's more senior to, to be that advocate, you know, to be that agent. And, and so I do think it's a, it's a model that, um, that we should be doing more of. Something great for us all to, to think about. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, perhaps I'll hand this over to you for a few final words of gratitude and future planning for the morning. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Cook. Uh, as a co-chair for this conference, I also just want to thank again uh, PSI, and I note that Sam uh, Moore, who's the executive director, is joining us. Uh, that has been sponsoring this two-day conference. And again, thank you, to Dr. Strauss. A very insightful, informative, and and thought-provoking uh, presentation that you've shared with us. And all of this couldn't have happened without Samantha Applewhite, who's been working very diligently in the background on behalf of Merit to to make things run smooth and trying to troubleshoot some of the AV technical challenges we've had today. Um, if you were excited by this morning, we'd certainly invite you to join this evening at 1700, where Dr. Lisa Richardson, again from the University of Toronto, is going to be speaking on diverse mentorship and mentorship for diversity. And you can use the same links they used this morning to join. Um, if you're unable to join us, then the Merit YouTube channel will have a recording available in the weeks that follow where you can catch up if you have competing responsibilities with family or with work. Um, very briefly or very shortly, uh, you'll see in the chat the program evaluation link and we'd invite you to provide some feedback so that we can think about how we might want to design and reorganize for next year as we move into uh, a new perhaps mixed model as to how we're going to present this conference. So thank you to all for your participation, your comments and your engagement and made this much richer conversation. And for some of you, you'll be off to work or others, you'll have an opportunity to engage more fully in this conversation as you move into your small groups. So with that, I wish you a great day and uh, hopefully I'll see many of you tonight at 1700.